was looking into all the mythology today and we have a nice little convergence with like what really separates Greek mythology from Roman mythology in the Scylla and Charybdis stuff. But I don't want to get too far ahead of myself because I'm pretty sure we start off with a different Greek myth. So um, where we left off, they had just escaped the Andromeda. And in this chapter, we have them, um, we have them, they wash up on shore, right? First, it was like in the Virginia Bay or something like that. Mm -hmm. And um, once they do, they encounter a Hydra. And so for Hydras, I mean, it's really self-explanatory. I feel like that's one of the myths that people most know from Hercules. Um, the idea that it is a nine-headed like dragon type thing. And um, eight of the heads are mortal. One is immortal, which um, like, well, we'll get to that part later. Um, so Hercules discovers that you can't cut off one of their heads because the moment you do, two other heads will regenerate from the wound. And he learns that you have to cauterize him as you're going. And um, so he has a helper when he does it that helps him figure this out and do it. Um, once they get to the ninth head, which happens to be the immortal one, they bury that one under a large rock, I believe. So um, I don't think that had actually died. It's kind of ambiguous. <laughs> um, but I also have my D and D monster manual in front of me, so I thought that this could be a better idea of what kind of monster they're up against because the Greek mythology doesn't give a ton of details. Um, I mean, like I said, we all know the facts that heads grow back from more heads grow back than were cut off, mm -hmm. and um, the poison uh, that aspect, which like the poison is so potent when you think about it that um what's her name dianera i don't remember her name right hercules wife is able to hold on to a cloak that is dipped in hydra blood and it's still poisonous even after she washes it out so it's it's that poisonous by contact and um the other kind of like proof that we have in greek mythology of how poisonous these arrows are is that um Pol or uh, Philoctetes, when he is stuck on that island by himself, they don't talk about him having other bow and arrows than the one that he took from Hercules. So he was reusing those Hydra blood dipped arrows. So I have to imagine the poison is quite potent if they can go through countless squirrels or whatever the hell he was <laughs> hunting on the island and still be poisoned en poisonous enough to affect Paris. Paris didn't die immediately, but he did succumb to the poison eventually. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so they didn't stand much of a chance. And I think it was very realistic that this was not a monster that they fought. This was a monster they escaped. Yeah. Yeah, if Clarice hadn't have come when she did, which you know that like after what just happened with Luke, they're like, well, I guess. <laughs> yeah. One thing with Hydra that I think is weird is that Hydra is something in the Marvel movies. Mm -hmm. um, Hydra is their villainous like organization that is like hidden inside S.H.I.E.L.D. the entire time. Yeah. And there are a lot of fan fictions about that, <laughs> about them meeting people, the Avengers, and the Avengers thinking that they're in Hydra and them being like the monster Hydra or them making fun of Hydra because it's not an actual hydra yeah but it also makes me wonder if that's where that idea came from like if that's way back in the day did they use the hydra myth as it's like the the like thing for hydra in the marvel movies is like a skull with a bunch of like octopus arms so it's not exactly an actual hydra but i guess it's close enough <laughs> Yeah, the other instance where like a work of fiction has randomly taken Hydra was Prison Break. And I don't remember much about this because I I've only I only know about Prison Break through osmosis. Like I have seen Jake watching it. And so I haven't seen every episode. I've seen enough to know the basic plot. 
And Hydra, I think, has six liters, and that's how they want. Or no, Scylla. They have a Scylla. They don't have a Hydra. My bad. I jumped ahead of myself. Um, but yeah, it's the idea that it could be named after the Hydra. I guess the idea is that it's incredibly hard to beat, that like the moment you take out maybe a leader or a faction of it, there's just going to be more of that spring up in their place. Mm-hmm. Unless you have fire, yeah, it would be hard to beat. I mean, I'm sure one of the Avengers has fire powers. They at least have weapons. Like, yeah. Percy Jackson has no weapons. They don't have guns or bombs or they have a little bit of that towards the very end of these books, but most of the time they don't do any of that stuff. And so it's not like they would be walking around with weapons like that to use, <laughs> but yeah. the Avengers, absolutely, they they definitely would do that. <laughs> yeah, well, we know that these kids are like resting on basically their demigod ADHD at this point. They're just dodging the poison um, and whatever weapons they have, I mean, Hermes did the packing for them. So they couldn't have brought more than they normally do. I mean, Hermes probably would have thought to pack like Annabeth's knife and um, Riptide is always kind of tied to Percy. So it's not like he could go without it. Um, Tyson doesn't really have a known weapon, I guess, or a weapon of choice at this point. But we do know that he packed his little trinkets. Um, So, I mean, they were very ill-equipped for this battle. And unless they had some sort of flamethrower, they were not going to make it. Yeah, and well, I feel like it would have been a very annoying battle is the best word I can think about it because Percy heals himself with water. And so they're right next to water. And so anytime a Hydra ever hurt him, he would just jump in the water and he would be fine. And yeah. so it would it would probably get pissed off at him that it, he wouldn't actually die. And it, other than like making sure that Annabeth doesn't get hit by anything, it's just like it would just keep going over and over and over and over again <laughs> until they figured out a way to find something that's fu- that has fire on it. Um, it. I feel like the Hydra would have like given up at some point as well. <laughs> Yeah. I've just been like, why won't this child die? <laughs> oh my gosh, yeah. So I'm glad they escaped that battle because it like okay, so the Hydra in the D D monster book um got a decent amount of natural armor and a pretty big amount of strength and constitution. So that means it's very strong. It has a lot of health, so it would be hard to take down. And yeah, the amount of natural armor means you have to roll pretty high to hit it. Um, yeah, so they they needed more equipment than they came with. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and um, as far as the weapons that we see the kids using in camp and stuff, there really wasn't anything that they they could have brought with them either. That now that I think about it, that would have been effective enough. Probably not. Yeah, so then we have Clarice come up, which we've talked about this a little bit here and there because in um, Sea of Monsters, Clarice is on a Confederate ship and Dior is a POC. So that just automatically feels like, how are they going to reconcile this? Um, But if they reconciled it any other way, I don't know that it would work as well for the story because, I mean, so I got a little intel from my brother on Confederate ships because um, he it's one of his special interests, you know, United States history, war history. And so um, the ships were wooden, but they had like iron pieces above the surface of the water um, and they had cannons, but the cannons weren't really even powerful enough for the ships to take out each other. Mm-hmm. And so it was it was not very effective navally in that way. Um, and so if we were to go with some other ships from some other, you know, like lost war, um, my brother's first thought was World War II, but that's already too tied into the Percy Jackson lore. 
for them to bring it in that way. And he also mentioned that the ships by World War II era might have been able to handle Charybdis better. Well, and, and it also has to be like American, um, I think. Like, I think the reason why he did that, what he did with it being Confederate ones is because this was an American ship that could just be there um, where they were leaving in New York. And so I can't think of another I mean, there's other battles, I suppose, like you could go back to like the Revolutionary War and make them British. Yeah. <laughs> um, but other than somehow turning the whole Confederate soldier thing on its head and like making them be their little bitches or something. Um, I don't know, unless they just completely change how if they can talk like they could just make it where they can't talk or communicate with them because <laughs> I mean, there's one line in these chapters. That's like, oh, they like Annabeth because she's from Virginia. And I'm like, well, that's not going to happen. <laughs> so I don't know what they're going to do with that because they don't like Percy because he's from the North. Yeah, <laughs> I guess yeah. They're not going to like Annabeth or Clarice. And so maybe they're just going to make them like undead things that can't speak or can't talk or something like that. I don't know. Maybe, yeah. They're going to have to fiddle with that for sure. But I mean, I do think that... You know, like you said, if they make them very subservient, like they have to obey Clarice and maybe they're a little bit salty about it, but we can get some comedy about it. I feel like they can make that work. Um, I mean, the other Confederate thing that's co more contemporary is Twilight, <laughs> like, you know, where they have Jasper as the ex-Confederate leader and they just never happen to mention that, <laughs> like, other than to say, oh, he has a military background. Yep, like, yep, I used to, I used to really hate black people. Um, <laughs> there's no, there's none of those people in, in this anyway, because this was based on Mormons. Um, but it's just there and you're just like, anyway, moving on. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And it's like, no, let's address this. Did you join because of where you lived and it was the thing to do? Did you join because there was pressure? Like, there could have been ways to write it and still have it work of like, oh, he joined because there was immense pressure around him around men his age. And then he he left the army and joins the vampires or whatever the heck, you know, they could have somehow worked it in, in a way where he could have been a Confederate leader and still been sympathetic for that reason. Yeah, so I'm thinking if they make these soldiers ones that like, maybe they're salty about it, but maybe they're also salty about choosing the wrong side. Maybe we put wrong side jokes in there. <laughs> um, but then again, that also, I don't know, does Rick care about alienating that kind of audience? I don't think so. No, <laughs> like, he, I don't think it's possible for Rick Riordan to care less if racists are angry at him. Yeah, but I don't know that, I mean, does everybody that has the Confederate flag necessarily think of it as a racism thing though? Cause I feel like there's some that try to pretend it's a Southern heritage thing and that for that them it's not connected. Them gaslighting themselves, but they say that it's not a racist thing while also giving excuses about why they can stomp black people wherever they want to. So it's like, they just don't want to have to admit that they're showing a flag and that Southern pride is somehow connected to the idea that black people should be your slaves. I don't know how else to put that, that you could think that Southern pride, that's not a good thing to admit about yourself that you see that as prideful, that you're proud of something like that. Um, you should be ashamed. <laughs> and so it's, yeah, he doesn't care about that. I think honestly, most of the show decisions would probably go along with like, what do we, we don't want to make our actors uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And we don't want to make the audience who is watching this, who love these actors because they look like them. Finally, we don't want to make them uncomfortable either. Like everything. Rick Riordan does is very much thinking about like kids who love him and how they, how they would feel about him. And so whatever they decide to do with this, I think that's going to be the motivations of how they figure it out. I don't think he gives even like a quarter of a fuck about how like Southern pride racist people, 
any hateful people at all would care about like what he what they think about him um maybe disney might yeah like they can art they would have argued about that before they even start filming so those arguments have already happened (laughs) i'm sure that some of that happened but disney has like has gone along with whatever he wanted for season one like one of the things I thought was funny, that article that I found about them talking about Medusa and that they wanted to bring in like the power differentials and take away like the the like misogynistic parts of that story and bring in the more like fem like feminist side of the story. And when they initially talked about that episode with Disney executives, Disney was like, oh, is this an episode where he's going to learn to like his dad more? And Rick was no know the opposite <laughs> the wow. actual is the opposite and so they obviously went along with whatever he said um so that would probably be the hardest part was to get disney on board with whatever they decide to do because you know of how conservative of a company disney is in general but i also think that they have some leeway when it comes to that because of how successful they've been so far <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So it'll be interesting to see if they take the risk. I mean, Dior hasn't said anything about the Confederate part specifically, but she did say she was excited about filming the boat scenes. Yeah, so. she gets to she that whole sequence. I, the whole time that that sequence was going on, I like every time I read anything right now, I'm thinking about what is this going to look like on the show. But especially that entire sequence, I was like, how are they going to film any of this? Like. I was like picturing how they're going to do it because it's such like a huge thing, like a huge sequence, tons of physical things happening, like crazy things happening. Like that's definitely something that's going to probably have to be filmed on like their stage, like where they filmed the Tunnel of Love stuff, just like redone. Because I don't know how they could film them like going around in a circle, being eaten by a giant mouth. Um, And then Percy like, flinging getting flung a like hundred feet into the air and crashing into and crashing into the ocean and only surviving that because he's a Poseidon child um in the way that he does besides all the other stuff that's going on in that scene without it being something like that without yeah that's gonna be wild it's gonna be it would be really fun for her to film because she's bossing everybody around yeah and she's the one in charge until the ship loads up but that's definitely fun stuff for her to do well and i'm curious how that scene's gonna look with dior because she's done the intimidating scenes she's done the the scenes where she is in percy's face bullying him and this one we got a little bit more playful we have her being like well i don't know if you're prisoners or not yet so um i guess you can stay and uh you know her being a little bit boastful that she has picked them up that she has helped them out um and i mean there's there's the allusions to the um the oracle she got of course which seems to mention percy i forgot what it was because it's been so long since i read this but um yeah i generally don't remember but she is there by herself Mm -hmm. um and usually quests involve three people yeah. So it's pretty obvious that the Oracle said something about how Annabeth and Percy are the other people that are likely supposed to be part of her quest. And that at some point, Percy is supposed to be the one to take the Golden Fleece and do, or at least find it. Because um, yeah. that is what I remember. Like, he does find it, but he gives it to her um, at, when we get to, like, the end, that she she's the one that has it. And so it's definitely like a team work sort of thing that they have going on there. Um, I don't even know. <laughs> that is it. Clarice is just like a whole, she's interesting in these chapters. Um, I'm just thinking of how interesting it will be to see them on screen um, play this stuff out because I don't know. Just the whole her showing up and being like, oh, camp kicked you out for all of time. And it's like, oh, that's nice. Uh, That's one of those things that I think about when it comes to this book is that the only reason they get back into camp at all is because they find Chiron and or they're able to reinstate Chiron. 
And the way that that happens is very un severely unplanned, like could not be more unplanned if it was humanly possible to be unplanned. And so there's no way that they could have known that that was going to work out that way. Mm -hmm. So I was just always thinking like, what if they didn't do that? Like, what if that didn't happen? They would have got back to camp and they would have kept them being kicked out of camp. Yeah. That's what would have happened. And I'm just like this, this, every quest is a little bit chaotic, but like this quest is so fucking chaotic and it's not their fault. It's because of all the other people around them. Like, it's absolutely ridiculous that what, how they started off on their quest was Hermes lying to them. Mm -hmm. And Clarice leaves with by herself and she knows that this obviously isn't right, that like she doesn't want to take anybody with her because they have to protect camp. Yeah. And it's like she can't take two other people with her even if she wanted to because what is camp going to do without three Aries kids to help them out? And then on top of that, it's like it's very obvious that Tantalus and stuff d doesn't give a fuck about what's going to happen to her. <laughs> And so it's like everything is super chaotic and wild and it's not either one of their faults. They're just trying to figure it out. And it's like, this is ridiculous that all these adults are just making really stupid decisions, <laughs> like yeah. in a way that doesn't necessarily happen the same way with other quests where they're, they're just trying to like keep up and it's not their, it's genuinely not their fault at all. And I'm just like, this is absurd. Like how many things these kids are having to deal with just trying to, this is such an easy quest, like save camp. Why is everyone making this so hard for them? Yeah. And poor Chiron, by the way, since we mentioned him <laughs> is stuck with all the other centaurs who are partying it up, which I mean, I've said this before that like Chiron is supposed to be the not like other centaurs centaur. I mean, he's exceptional for not being like that. He's with the party ponies. And yeah. one thing I liked about that is that he, I liked the fact that he was mad at Annabeth for letting Percy leave camp. Mm -hmm. um, I enjoy any father figures that want to actually protect him from harm instead of directly pushing him into it and then leaving him there. Um, so that's a nice, that's nice. I, he even doesn't do things like that in other books, but I appreciate it right now that he's consistent and being like, what are you doing? Percy should be at camp. Why is he out in the wild where Luke could like kill him? What are you doing? You're supposed to protect him. And she's just like, anyway, <laughs> he basically just has to move on from that because it's like, well, it's already happened. So what am I going to say about that? But I still appreciate the fact that he is like, you didn't listen to me, child. You're supposed to keep him places where he won't get murdered. I mean, that's not camp right now either, but, <laughs> but that's still what he said. Um, I, yeah, I, I just like the fact that in this book, Chiron is such a little dad to both of them of being like, I want to protect you. I want you to be, both of you to be safe. And you're absolutely very unsafe right now. And I don't approve of this. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, he's actually the leader that everyone wishes Dumbledore was. <laughs> yes, he does way more. Honestly, Chiron in the first book does more. Even the things that he does, there are definitely things he does that I don't like in later books. But I could even argue that him hiding the whole end part of the prophecy from Percy is him trying to do this general thing of like you are right and the way when he tells percy that in the last book he says like you have so many things on your shoulders right now that you're carrying already we didn't want to like burden you with something else mm -hmm. it's not a thing of like i don't want to tell you so that you will kill yourself at the right time and i'm just like fattening you up for that in the way that dumbledore does he legitimately just doesn't want percy to have to deal with any more than he already is and I'm like, I can at least understand that because that's nice of you to try to do. <laughs> that's very nice of you to try to take something off of his plate when he has everything else. And he's one of the only people that actually even thinks about him like that. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, in, in Harry's case, I guess 
Is the implication there that if he would have known earlier, he would have been more reckless or would have killed himself? I'm, I'm I am honestly don't know. It That whole thing with Dumbledore reminds me a lot of just, like, abusive dynamics. Like, the idea of, like, I'm not even going to give you the chance to tell me no. Mm -hmm. um, even though, like, would would Harry have said no? No, probably not. Like, but they don't even offer him the choice of deciding. It's just, this is just what he has to do. And it's like this weird idea, like imagining that a kid would like abandon everyone that he knows in this world. Just if you tell him and let him know what he's supposed to do longer than five minutes before he has to do it. It's like, I don't think that he would have been like, I don't want to do this. Goodbye. I'm going to leave now. <laughs> can't imagine Harry ever doing something like that at any point anyway. And so I generally don't know, besides just Dumbledore being a control freak and wanting absolute control, like if you're going to compare Dumbledore to anybody in like Percy Jackson, I would compare him more to Zeus than anyone else because Zeus just wants total control of everyone yeah, um, and does whatever he wants. Like Dumbledore acts like he's nicer. He puts on like a nice face and is able to do that in the way that Zeus doesn't feel like he has to. And so he doesn't do it. Mm -hmm. um, but it's very much the same thing of, I just want total control of everything. And if I don't, and I don't have to tell this child that he has a Horcrux on his forehead. So why would I do that if I don't have to tell him? I can just get away with not doing it. Yeah, well, I mean, I don't think, well, so, okay, so I'm just trying to follow the logic here because this made my brain go on a little rabbit hole. So um, the idea with Harry being a horcrux, because I know that J.K. Rowling's also hesitant to call him a proper horcrux. He's a mistaken semi-horcrux. Um, so with the idea being that he needs to die, in order to get rid of that piece of Voldemort's soul. Like, is there a danger of him knowing too soon, him thinking like, well, I'm gonna die, I guess this is fine? Um, sure, but I don't see Harry being that type of hero because Harry is the type who would be like, did we get all of the horror crooks as possible that I need to be here for? And uh, then going off and doing what he needs to do. Yeah, I don't think he would have left the Horcruxes for everybody else. Out of the out of these two heroes, like Percy and, Her and Harry, if there was one that was going to just kill themselves to make everyone's life easier, it's Percy. Mm -hmm. Like, not Harry. Percy would have done that. Like, if the roles were reversed in that way, where Percy had to die in order for everyone to be saved, he would have just done it as soon as he heard about it and just got everything over with. Um, Harry isn't quite like that for whatever reason. Um, that's not, he's not quite as self-sacrificing in that way because he's written by an asshole that doesn't know how to write abused characters. So he doesn't act like somebody who actually is, but, but Percy is. <laughs> so like that, yeah, if any woman was gonna do that, like that, it would be Percy. <laughs> yeah, Percy's the first one to be like, everybody else could do this job better than me. And Harry's not. It's it's like a humility thing. Yeah, like it's kind of, I mean, to compare like the first quest they ever go on, um, like the whole, the chess game and then the other quest that they cut out in the movies, the um, potion one, I think. Yeah, it was like a potion, um, a potion, what do you call it, like, puzzle kind of thing, yeah. But either way, in Harry Potter, like, one friend gets taken out in the chess game, the other friend gets taken out in the potion thing, and then he is the one left at the end. That would never happen in Percy Jackson. Mm -hmm. That would never, never, Percy would start himself on fire before he would let both of his friends sacrifice themselves for his benefit. Instead, he flings himself off of the, off of the arch. 
-hmm. after he's known and he's known Annabeth by that point for three days mm -hmm. at, at the most three days. And for the two weeks before that, she basically just stalked him and he thought that she was a bully. Mm -hmm. And besides that, anyway, when he, he realizes that she likes him two days later, he flings himself off of a St. Louis arch to save her life. Like that's, that's where his priorities are. <laughs> Yeah, if he would that never would have happened. And it, that's like those little those little things with Harry Potter that I'm just like, yeah, I can tell who wrote this and that you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> and it bothers me that you don't because your main character deserved a lot better than he got. But I can't help that because you're the one who wrote him this way. Yeah. Uh, okay, so I'm trying to think before we run into the next monsters. The next thing that we could talk about is probably the message from Aries or the message with Aries. I forgot that it happened with smoke every time that you've talked about it prior to this, but that he's basically like steam. Um, so it's some sort of virus message. Mm -hmm. And she's still intimidated and he's still scary. And even, even Percy is like, I'm feeling a presence that feels very familiar and I'm angry all of a sudden. <laughs> Yeah. That scene was very upsetting for me to read. I think that it's funny that I forgot about that scene until I saw a video about it a couple months ago on here and it was like, oh, okay. Because he like holds his fist up, fist up like he's going to hit her. And it's another one of those scenes where I'm like, did Rick Riordan meet my dad? Like, did he? Should I like ask him this just to be sure that he didn't base his character on him? Because it's very, very much like that. Um, especially the line he says about like, I should have had one of my sons do this. My dad very much wanted me to be a boy. Ugh, yeah. um, that's why I'm very not feminine at all. Um, like I've never worn, I don't know how to do makeup at all. I don't know how to do any of those things. I've had the same hair my entire life. I've never even dyed my hair before. Do I want to? Yeah, that would be, I think that would be fun. I even know like what I would if in a magical world where I had money to do stuff like that and I could do that, I would do it. Um, and I know what I would do, but yeah, I'm, st I'm to this day, I'm terrified of wearing the clothes that I actually would like to wear, which is like dresses. I'm a actively terrified of wearing them. <laughs> Um, because he didn't want me to be feminine at all, and I'm not. <laughs> and I think that it's funny that my sister is very feminine, um, but I'm not at all. And which always confused people when we were growing up. They thought that my sister was my stepsister because of how much we were not alike at all. Um, so yeah, I, I, it makes sense to me that Aries would be like that, that he would be disappointed with having a daughter as opposed to a son and would think that she would um fail on this quest like the only reason she's gonna fail on this quest is because the people at camp gave her no absolutely nothing to work with and also aries didn't like from what you said about the ship that she has he basically gave her the worst possible ship for her to use mm -hmm. if you're going out into the middle of the ocean why would you give her a ship that's not meant to be in the middle of the ocean yeah if you actually want her to succeed, that doesn't make any sense. Um, the thing about that, that's like one of those, that scene of Aries is one of those things that like, it sounds weird, but the number one like change I hope to happen in the show is for, is for Annabeth to somehow hear that too, purely so that she can look at Percy's reaction to it and realize that Gabe was worse than she probably realizes at this point. Because I just want someone else to know how bad Gabe actually was. Because mm -hmm. Percy's not going to tell anybody a single fucking thing. We're not going to do that. And I, I was thinking about this the other day, but um, one thing that's kind of weird is that when you're in a place that you're not normally in, like camp or something like that, in this way, it's easier to pretend like there isn't a horribly abusive person at home ruining your life. You can like almost cosplay as being a normal person um, and just never talk about that person. And that's basically what I would do when I would go away to like, there was a couple years we went to like church camp 
And even when I was in college, uh, I'm honestly not sure if I ever actually spoke about my dad to anyone that I met the first two years, at least, that I was in college. I'm almost curious to add, like, I'm not going to talk to those people because I don't want to, but I'm almost curious to find out, like, do you remember anything I even said about him? Did I even talk about him? Because I just basically acted like I didn't have a father (laughs) around people that didn't already know him. I just would not bring him up unless I absolutely had to. It's Um, not really a topic of conversation at college a ton other than around holidays. So I'm sure in the holidays, somebody asked, you know, are you going home to your family? But that's probably the extent of it. That's what I mean with like stuff with Percy is that when he's at camp, he's at camp and he's dealing with camp things people aren't going to ask him about his abusive ass stepfather. They're, they're not going to ask about his stepfather. They might ask about his mom, but even his mom, they might not ask about. And so he can, he's never going to tell anybody about how Gabe really was, especially now that he's gone. Um, it would have to be something like this. So it's like, this is like the one chance I feel like on screen anyway, we could see like Annabeth realizing it, like, I don't even know if I want her to even bring it up with him because that's usually not a good idea. Um, Like the one, the thing that I I really liked about that scene was how Percy reacted because that's how we react. Um, Is that he doesn't, like when Annabeth asks him what's wrong, he doesn't even talk. (laughs) Yeah, you would like not want to talk after that. But he also doesn't look at Clarice and doesn't like, doesn't want to look at her and doesn't bring it up with her because yeah, you don't want to do that. Usually, and I, it's just, it's a hard situation when you're a kid Mm -hmm. because this definitely happened. Like there were kids that I knew that I'm pretty sure I've talked about on here before, but I can't remember that I recognized that they were going through the same thing as me when I was in middle school and high school. And I didn't say anything to them because it's like, you're a kid, you can't do anything about it. And so saying it out loud somehow makes it worse to like admit that what's going on with both of you and having it out there in like the open. But I do remember that those people that I knew that was happening with, I used to just like watch them sometimes at school to try to figure out how they were. Because you care about that person because you know what they're going through, even if you can't really talk about it. And I do remember some of those kids that I was in school with, there were times when I would like look at them and see them just looking at me. And it was them doing the same thing with me, just like looking at me and being like, are you okay? And me looking at them and being like, are you okay? (laughs) And, but that's like all you can really do in that sort of situation. And so Percy not even wanting to look at Clarice because he doesn't want to bring it up. It's never a good idea to bring it up. Um, We would just get angry and deny it if you did bring it up. That was like an accurate response to how somebody who experienced this would actually respond, which was nice because a lot of times in stories like this, they kind of have like the full house, you know, moment mm-hmm. or GI Joe moment, if I'm, I'm being really old school by talking about GI Joe. <laughs> but so you get my point is that they'll have like, they'll play like the soft music and they'll be like, are you okay? I can save you from your abusive dad. It's like, no, I can't, no, I can't. And like, thank God this universe is based in actual reality, which is that no, you can't do shit. (laughs) Like you can't save, especially if you're another child, you're not gonna save anyone from anything. And Mm -hmm. so I'm glad that they don't even try to, like, put that on anybody in any of these stories. They don't act like they can save Clarice from her extremely abusive dad that also can't die and is immortal and is angry, just base level. (laughs) Yeah, well, I mean, this establishes something that I feel like J.K. Rowling really failed to establish with Harry and Draco, but she wanted to or she at least tried to which is like all of these weird random scenes we have with Harry interacting with Draco where Harry's trying to be nice to him or he's trying to save him and stuff. I like the room of requirement one in the last book comes to mind where he saves him and Crab and Goyle from the flaming, you know, room of requirement. Like theoretically, does it sound too horrible to let your worst enemy at school burn in burn alive? 
Yes, theoretically. But we didn't establish an emotional relationship between Harry and Draco where Harry saving Draco makes sense. In, in this one, this is establishing something between Percy and Clarice where we see that he sees there's a different side to her and he doesn't even need to mention to it, it to her. He's just going to catalog it in his brain of, oh, this is why she's that way. Okay, I can understand that now. It's a thing, too, of, like, they have the characterization set up already for Aries. Mm -hmm. And so having him be someone who would be willing, who would treat his kids like that is not surprising. Mm -hmm. He's already on the show, at least. I can't remember if he says this stuff in the books, but I'm pretty sure he does, where he says that he hates his own children mm -hmm. and that he hates the, sum the winter solstice day because it's the only day of the year he has to actually see his children. He, like, he literally cannot stand the fact that his children exist. And so somebody like him treating their kids like that, that's just a rational sort of thing to expect almost from how they show his characterization. And even Clarice in the books and definitely on the show, she has reasons to be mad at Percy, but they never treat her like Draco. Like there's always a little bit of like humanity behind her. like. The worst things about Clarice, at least the show version in the first season, is Luke lying about her. <laughs> That's the worst thing about her in season one is that you think that she is working with with Kronos when she's not, she's not, she's not, she's not. She's just, when you take that away, it's like, okay, she just doesn't like Percy because he, because she feels threatened by him because of how good he is at beating the Minotaur the first time when he was a t tiny little child. That's like, whatever, fine. After that, she's just like another person annoyed by him that he can deal with. And it's much more like even, okay. you know, like even in these scenes, he's like, oh, did nobody want to go on the quest with you? Yeah. And it, it's like, the, it's very even like going back and forth at each other. It's not like one person bullying the other one anymore. Um, because now she is, now we realize that she's not a horrible person. Luke is that she never actually was she was just angry at percy and you can understand why since aries is her stupid ass father <laughs> yeah. um but yeah that that makes a huge difference for how you show her to show her as a human like of of like somebody who's not just like an angry stereotype of an angry british person that's mm -hmm. i don't even know like draco never even gets to the point really in the books where he even i'm not even sure that he even realizes like that he did anything wrong necessarily or anything by the end of the books it's really weird like people compare him sometimes to like zuko i don't even think he got that far <laughs> i don't think he even far in if anything dudley comes closer because dudley at least acknowledges and says I don't think your existence is bad, you know, like, uh, but Draco, I mean, I'm pretty sure the ending we get from him, everything after or before the prologue or epilogue, sorry, everything before the epilogue is just him and his family kind of weasel away from the last battle after his mom lies to Voldemort. I'm pretty sure that's it. Like, there's no thank you for saving my life. There's no, like, standing up for Harry at all. Of course not. Um, so, yeah, he got no sort of redemption. Clarice, I, I get the feeling that going on this quest alone, even though she hasn't been on it that long at this point, has to be incredibly lonely. Like, literally, the only people she has to talk to are these undead Confederate soldiers who really are probably only interested in listening to her and only interested in so much as they owe Ares a favor. Like, you know, that's that's it. And so there's no emotional stake there. And yeah. yeah. Clarice reminds me in, in these, honestly, this book forward, it gets much better as more time goes on. Like, just to give like perspective, like during the Heroes of Olympus books, like in The Lost Hero, when Percy is missing, um, and they get back to camp like Clarice is one of the people that the first thing they ask is where is like did you find Percy mm -hmm. and they and like Annabeth tells her no and she's upset about that like she 
cares about him. She's out there looking for him with Annabeth, trying to find him when she can leave camp. And so they have like no bad blood whatsoever by the time we even get to like the last book in this series. And so it's, she's more of just someone that because her dad is how he is, that I feel like she feels like she can't show any weakness and that she has to be like, I'm so big and bad. Look at how cool my ship is and look how undead all of my people are. And my dad is the best and all that kind of stuff because she feels like that pressure to like, not, not necessarily make him proud, but like please him in some way. Like she's still trying to at this point, which I can't blame her for wanting to try it, especially because this is her first quest. So this is her first chance to even try doing that. And she basically like lets that go after this book. I don't remember that ever being an issue after that, but that doesn't really say much because I don't remember a lot. So maybe it is, but I don't, I don't think in any other books going forward, whatever is she just kind of is like, my dad is my dad and he kind of sucks, but I'm really good at fighting anyway. <laughs> um, but that's more what she's like. And so that's a lot easier to handle um, because she's not being overly mean or cruel or being a she's not actually being a bully mm -hmm. like it's it's way more obvious to tell like where she's coming from and also at the same time she also is just like she's admitting the like holes almost in her story like when percy is like you know where is anyone else and teases her she's like we had to leave them at camp to protect camp and it's like, so she's being like, oh, my dad is so cool because he thinks that I can do this. But it's like, actually, is he actually you know? or like, would you rather be at camp right now, like helping everybody and you're forced to go on this anyway, even though you don't want to be here and you're just trying to make the best out of this situation, even when they're talking to her and telling her, like trying to tell her, like, we can't go around the monsters and stuff that whole like discussion where they're all saying like this isn't gonna work it's also as it goes along you're also just like i generally don't know what else they could have she could have done even though it obviously doesn't go well the other options they have don't really work well either so like what was she supposed to do i don't i don't i don't know like i have an idea so like to get into the chill the scylla and charybdis part so um, this is where we get the convergence of Greek mythology and Roman mythology that I was talking about that is so emblematic of the differences. Um, in the Greek mythology, Scylla and Charybdis are most known from the Odyssey, where Circe had told um, Odysseus, sail closer to Scylla because Scylla has six heads. And Scylla, as a six-headed monster, can only grab as many men as she needs to fit into her mouth. And um, you can also pray to Scylla's monster mother and ask that Scylla not grab any more men than that. Mm -hmm. And so Odysseus has to choose, am I going to potentially wreck the ship and sail closer to Charybdis, or am I going to have to sail closer to this monster who's going to take six of them anyway? And he chooses to go to the monster. It takes six. And, um, I mean, it, it was a sacrifice of six, but he doesn't come out with any men. Like, he doesn't. Um, the, the Aeneid eventually says there were two men that escaped, one of which is one that Aeneas meets after Scylla and Charybdis. So, um, the cheap shot here is that Odysseus was able to go by sailing closer to, to Scylla. Jason and the Argonauts, which also is another myth that this book heavily favors, um, he was able to go through the wandering rocks, which Annabeth mentions, um, because he was guided by Thetis, Achilles' mom, who is a Nereid. So they literally had goddess GPS, essentially. Mm -hmm. And um, like you can't do it without that, and especially in the CSS Birmingham, because like I said earlier, it's a wooden ship with iron on top. So you hit a rock, you're hitting a rock on wood and that's not gonna work. So, um, and then Charybdis, they weren't supposed to be in the deep ocean anyway in a ship that was built for civil war era. So going towards a whirlpool, that's why we have Tyson all of a sudden saying, 
oh shit, I can hear the pistons, something's wrong. Um, yeah, like, oh, and, shit, it's going to blow up. <laughs> yeah, but so the idea, oh wait, I didn't get to the Aeneid. So the Aeneid, how Aeneas gets around Silas and Tryptus, this is so cheap, it's such a cheap shot by the Romans, he's able to sail around. <laughs> so both of the Greek heroes had to go through and Aeneas just can go around. So part of that is because Virgil puts the Aeneid in actual real life locations, because again, this is supposed to be mythology that then um, leads into Roman history. So everything is real, every, all of the places are real. And um, so he's able to say they sail around Sicily, but we can't map out where Scylla and Charybdis are based on the Odyssey's description and those islands. So we can't say that that same path around existed for him. Plus, um, like the idea of Aeneas versus Odysseus is supposed to be Odysseus loses literally every single one of his men. He loses a good chunk of his fleet via the Lystragonians, and then the rest ate some sacred cattle and got oofed by Zeus, <laughs> you know? So um, he survived with nobody. Aeneas, pretty sure unless they died of natural causes, his men make it. And um, not only that, but after he gets around Scylla and Charybdis and he gets to Polyphemus's island, he finds a man who was left behind by Odysseus. And so uh, this guy's like, I, I was left behind in Polyphemus's cave, but I hid and I escaped. I, if you are Trojans, I'd rather you kill me as a Greek then me die by this this cyclops or you could just take me with you and so they opt to take him with them and it was a way of the romans being like look at our military prowess look at how great our leaders are compared to the greek leaders because odysseus lost all of his men and aeneas is taking on greek men now because another one that got left behind is in circe's like still transformed into like a pig or something hmm. Yeah, so so Zoe, Zoe Nightshade doesn't like Percy at first. <laughs> His story is like this. Um, yeah, I don't even know what to say. Like, of course, Romans make it better because they wrote theirs afterwards. Yeah, after so they would they would do that um, and be like, look how amazing we are. Our lives are amazing. Obviously, you can just sail around it. Like, okay. You don't think that people would have done that if they could have done that the first time around? I'm pretty sure they would have done that if it was possible yeah. for them to do that. And this story shows it, at least how this one happens, it's not possible for them. They tried. They really tried. They, they thought of like, they listed off like four different things they could do. Mm -hmm. And especially when Percy's talking about it, he very much has like the kind of just, I don't know, outlook of like, this is never going to work. And there's nothing we can do about this. So my idea, and I don't know if this one would work, but I would still sail closer to Scylla. I would go the Odysseus route, but I would only have the top deck stocked with the Confederate soldiers. I don't know how long that would work because I imagine they don't taste as good as fresh humans. But um, I it had, I mean, Scylla would be occupied if she grabbed six little undead confederates um so i don't know like even if i had to choose between the impossible options because this is literally the rock in the hard place kind of thing if i had to choose i would still choose scylla and i would try to find a way to only have scylla snatch the undead people mm -hmm. They would probably have been okay with that. Like, I'm, I was just thinking, like, would they be okay with the undead soldiers being taken instead of them? Um, because if anything, Greek demigods have a whole guilt complex. Um, they don't like people doing things, dying on behalf of them. But they probably would have, if for no other reason, than it was the only thing they could think of. Yeah. Um, to get out of there alive. But it just... It was a lot <laughs> for all of them to try to figure out at the same time. It's like, I don't know what else they could have tried to do in that situation than that. Um, it's another, like, imagining seeing that on the show, it's a kind of similar situation like the arch is in St. Louis in season one, where, like, everything is going wrong in that 
episode at the same time, it does a really good way of showing how hard it is for them to survive in a world like this and how they've been abandoned. Like, you know, they don't even have time for Percy to like jump into a lake to see if he would get, if he would stop getting poisoned to death because Echidna is trying to kill them and they have no other choice but to run into the arch and then they're screwed <laughs> when she can get in there. And so this feels like a similar situation of all three of them and Tyson even listing off all the things that are happening and trying to like problem solve. And it's every single thing that they could think of is just like, there's something in the way that stops it from working. Mm -hmm. um, primarily this time because Aries gives her the worst ship possible. Yep. Like it's really his fault that this happened to them. Yeah. Like, like I said, what my brother told me is had he chosen a different era, there was a chance that that ship could have made it. Yeah. And, um, yeah, so it's interesting that he picked, I mean, there were naval battles in the Civil War, but they weren't very technologically advanced. So he could have chosen another, you know, like naval battle to, because I don't know that it necessarily has to be at that spot, you know, like, I feel like Ares is a god. He could summon a ship from anywhere. He could have summoned any sunken ship he wanted, repaired it magically, and had the fleet be whatever leaders he wanted that were fallen soldiers. Theoretically. Like, I don't see why it has to be one ship that and, like, its exact crew. Mm -hmm. I wanted to talk about Tyson. Um... I love Tyson, and so the end of these chapters made me really sad, but um, for everyone, really, Percy and Tyson, even though I know that he's okay, it still sucks a lot. Um, I thought that it was sweet when they are by Monster Donut, mm -hmm. um, and I appreciate the joke that Rick Riordan makes that franchise chains pop up so fast because they're part of Hydra's arms, mm -hmm. or heads, or however they put it again. And that when, and that I liked the part when Percy chops one of them off accidentally and she's like, you just made another franchise. And he's like, does this matter right now? Yeah. <laughs> like I could literally like picture the actor saying something like that, like priorities. I don't care if there's another donut shop somewhere right now. Um, but I did like how, how Percy is like, I need to talk to Annabeth and find out why she has such a weird bias against Tyson. Um, because he hasn't done anything at this point to like justify that. And there's obviously something there that I don't know. Um, mm. And I always really like, I really like him admitting that he's jealous of them being in a, a hideout place that Luke and Thalia and Annabeth used when they were younger, mm -hmm. because it's that whole thing of never feeling like you belong <laughs> or like even where you feel like you might belong, you don't really belong. Like that whole idea of like, even in my group of friends, I feel like if I wasn't there anymore, that nobody would care that I would, they would just like continue on without me as if I was never there in the first place. That's a very like abuse sort of dynamic thing that happens a lot. And that's definitely Percy. Like he never had people in his <laughs> life in that way. So he would feel like that. And so I like him just being able to admit it because I feel like that all the time. Um, I have since I was a kid and it still is something that I'm, I'm not gonna pretend like I don't feel jealous of people. I do, like almost everyone. <laughs> I don't mean to sound like horrible, but it's just as a fact, like I don't have anybody in that way. Like I have some family now, but I don't have friends or partners or anything. And so seeing people have that stuff seemingly so easy and it's impossible for me, you can't help but feel jealous that they got something that you've never been able to get. Mm -hmm. And so that's very much what he feels. Um, sometimes people misconstrue that to mean like romantic jealousy. And I kind of assume that that's because a lot of the kids who read these books for the first time probably just assumed that jealousy means something in romantic situations. Um, that's the way that most people talk about it, but I don't think that it's something like that. I think it's more, he's jealous that she had these people okay. that made her feel understood and were protecting her. When has anyone protected Percy like that? 
Like he's the one usually protecting everyone else. Chiron is trying to protect him, but he still can't. Like, I honestly don't know. I'm thinking of all the books, but I honestly don't know of a time when somebody like makes a hideout purely for him to like hide in so that he doesn't have to deal with dealing with everyone. He's the one that has to deal with Luke all the time. <laughs> and it, people get mad at him because he doesn't want to. It's the other way around. He's basically protecting everybody else from that whole situation of Luke and who he really is. And so he doesn't get protected that way. So it's hard to see other people get that. So I appreciated that. And I thought it was really adorable that he's like, Tyson, go find some powdered donuts. Mm -hmm. um, I want to eat some powdered donuts. And he was like, okay, I will find some. And he comes back five minutes later, here you go. And it's like, wait a second, <laughs> we're, we're, we're in the middle of the woods. And he's just like, I'm just, whatever. He's just eating them. And like, I just thought it was cute how Annabeth was like, there's something suspicious about this. And Percy's like, you know what? I don't even care. <laughs> like, he's like, Tyson's happy. He's eating his donuts. They're not killing him because he's obviously eating them. So I'm just going to let him have this win <laughs> because what else are we going to do at this point? We're in like a swamp in the middle of nowhere. Of course, there's a donut shop that just pops up right next to us that is in no way suspicious. Like, well, what else am I supposed to do at this point? This is absolutely ridiculous. Like, this is the same night that they left camp. <laughs> like, this is like an hour later. I would also just be like, you know what? Whatever. Tyson, just eat your damn donuts and have a nice time because at least we have that going for us. Um, but it's also, it makes me sad that like the last thing that Annabeth says before Clarice, before the Hydra shows up and then Clarice and she never gets to finish her story is like, you can never trust a Cyclops. And I'm like, that's so freaking frustrating. And I know that that's the whole thing that Rick Riordan is doing with that story is showing how those like prejudices against people can be irrational because at this point it's very irrational for yeah. to still feel that way about Tyson or to like it's just funny that they're sitting there talking about how traumatic running into Luke was when she's sitting there trying to get Percy not to trust Tyson and it's like out of both of these people which one is the bad guy again <laughs> like I I think Tyson's fine He's eating donuts. What is wrong with the child? There's nothing wrong with the child. And so it just is, su it sucks. It's a briefly sucks that she like, isn't able to like, let any of that stuff go before he seemingly blows himself up to mm -hmm. help them. Um, I, even though I knew that was happening, I was like, oh God, it's already happening. Cause this is like making me really sad that Percy is going to have to think that his brother sacrificed himself for him. That's literally the worst case scenario mm -hmm. of his life. He can never possibly, you can never possibly imagine a worse thing for him anyway, happening than something like that. Pretty much that's worse than him, way worse than him actually dying is Tyson seemingly doing it. And I love how Percy is Percy <laughs> and that when, when Tyson is in that room, he tries to run in to save him. Even though Annabeth is like, you will die if you go in there. He's like, I don't care. Like, do you think I care? I don't care. Like, I'm not leaving. I'm not leaving him to die in there. Like, are you cra like crazy? He would never do that. And he just by happenstance doesn't actually get blown up. Because mm -hmm. um, the what it, that monster name grabs him. Um, yeah. But I, the whole time I was imagining that. First off, I was just imagining like that stunt is going to be crazy to have him to have him be grabbed by that monster and then be like flung into the air when he's able to get the monster off of him and then the ship blows up so he gets like flung into the water and just crashes in like the most aggressive violent way possible and it's especially i could like literally picture them ending like an episode with that especially because the first thing he asks when he wakes up is where is tyson and Annabeth has to say, like, I'm sorry, but I don't think he survived. And Percy is just like, I don't want to be here anymore. <laughs> um, I don't know. And it, so, yeah, that's going to be, it will be interesting to see that on the show and how they, I generally don't remember 
what happens to make Annabeth stop being so freaking prejudiced against Tyson. I, I know that it happens because when they interact in other books, she's very sweet with him mm-hmm. and he loves her and like gives her hugs all the time. And she loves him too. And so I know that she gets over it at some point in this book. And I'm like, can you just do this already? Yeah. Would you stop being mean to the autistic child? <laughs> like, please. Yeah. And he doesn't even realize that she doesn't like it. Like, that's the sad part, because they have him, like, grabbing her hands and stuff. Like, he's fully scared while they're surrounded by these monsters. And then he goes down and fixes the ship anyway. I'm just, Mm -hmm. yeah, Tyson is a treasure. And um, it's going to be a rough scene, like you said. We know from Walker and how he is in interviews and behind the scenes that he is going to eat up the special effects and the um, the stunts involved in all of that. He's probably going to want it to look like the book. He's probably going to be like, yes, drop me onto a flaming ship. Yeah, yeah. like he's going to be, that's going to be so much fun for him to film the parts that they will allow him to film. Yeah. Um, that's going to be really fun for him to do. And it'll definitely be like complicated stunt work with their stunt team to do all of like, that's going to be a whole huge thing um, for them to pull all of that stuff off all at once. Anyway, it's going to be really great to watch that happen one day and, and all that kind of stuff. It's just a wild, like, especially, (laughs) especially because the next chapter is Cersei's Island. And I'm like, can they relax? Like, this is like the most ridiculous day this is like the like it's like this on quests i get it but this quest particularly because of how they were like forced to leave Mm -hmm. the way that they did everything happens in such a ridiculous way that it's like can they calm down have they even gotten to sleep yet (laughs) yeah i don't even know like this is all happening so fast and now he's gonna get turned into a fucking hamster (laughs) like and and i don't even I don't really even remember everything that happens on Cersei's Island, but but it's like it's not like it, they have a chance to stop. And it, oh, also, the other thing about these chapters is that, of course, he has another dream about Grover where um, Polythemus sees that Grover is like trying to take the sti- the, the, the stuff out and is like, oh, I can fix that. So everything will be done by tomorrow. And he's talking about like, oh, don't worry if people show up here, I have things to stop them from getting here. And it's like, oh, this is just super (laughs) of him in the middle of all this. They did sleep then because he has a horrible nightmare about his best friend dying. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) But but it's just like every time he sleeps, he has a dream about Grover being in like mortal danger. And yeah, or both. (laughs) And, And like, in them and it's like okay so after all of this stuff we're gonna have to show up on wherever grover is and more things are going to attack us when we get there this is so great (laughs) yeah they have not been able to catch their breaths this one is one after the other and i feel like in a way rick is trying to mimic the cadence of the odyssey where it feels like everything's happening one after the other but it only feels that way in the Odyssey because he's telling the story to somebody. Like it's a story within a story in a sense, because we start with him on Calypso's island. And then he makes it to the island of this princess where he tells, you know, like some of the rest of the lore. And it's not in order. So um it feels like in the Odyssey, oh, like all of these things happened to Odysseus, but it's really over the span of seven years. And most of it happened within the first two or three months. Um, so yeah, I feel like Rick's trying to mimic that a little bit with the pacing here. Mm-hmm. Um, and also just, I mean, the sea of monsters is the way that he is connecting the Odyssey and Jason and the Argonauts. So I I do feel like he wants to hit all of those same beats because I feel like Jason and the Argonauts might also encounter Cersei. Um, so hitting these beats one after the other kind of also follows the general rules of like, you know, the path of monsters you end up going down. And it does fit with like the general like theme of this book, which is that camp is dying. Mm-hmm. 
And so everything is rushed because they are, they are rushed. Like regardless, it's like every, they need to move as fast as humanly possible. Mm-hmm. And so like the first book, there was a deadline, but they had like two weeks or something to mm-hmm. reach that deadline. In this one, it's like the longer we're away from camp, the more kids are dying and we don't even know who's alive still. And so the like kind of almost like panic, like panic, like energy <laughs> that they all feel about all of this fits like the general thing of the Odyssey anyway, because that's a very like panic inducing sort of story of like one after another. And it fits that general theme of, they feel like all this pressure to rush, but the more that they rush, the more things go wrong. Um, Like how these things tend to happen in these sort of stories. Yeah, yeah. and um, so it's, yeah, it's interesting that there is such a set group of monsters that they're having them encounter them in similar order to Greek myths that we've already seen and still changing it. I mean, I love what they're doing with the Golden Fleece. I don't think that, I can't say for sure because I haven't read Jason and the Argonauts. I just know a little bit of the lore here and there, but I don't think it's necessarily part of the lore that it enhances the aroma and the, um, the colorfulness, the vibes of all the plants around the area. Um, so that is definitely more, I feel like Rick expanded on it. If anything, they might have, there might have been a throwaway line here or there. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I, I just, I don't know. This was my favorite book. I remember it being my favorite book for that reason, because it does feel like this one is so heavy on the Greek mythology. It is. It's, there's so much of that happening because it's kind of in a weird plot wise it's kind of in like a weird in between place like plans are happening but they haven't actually fully come to fruition yet mm-hmm. like they do make a a comment of like luke let us get away too easy and it's like yeah because if he doesn't kill them then he wants them to get the golden fleece for him basically yeah in his mind they'll he doesn't care how many kids die in the meantime but at some point he thinks, well, if they don't, if I don't kill them right now, then they can get the fleece back and bring Thalia back and then Thalia will join me and I won't need Percy anymore. Mm-hmm. And so if I don't kill him now, I'll just kill him later. I love how Annabeth shut that one down too, because she was, she was telling Percy, he is so, or you are so much like Thalia, it's crazy. And that's how I know, because you would never join Luke. And that's probably the only way she could have explained it, where he's like, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, no, that's silliness to like, Thalia would never, obviously would never join Luke either. Um, She gets one of the best moments ever with him because she, because he's so sure about that. And he is, it's not possible to be more wrong. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And so it's great that she gets that. So the reason, the connecting factor is the not being completely pleased with your parents, right? Mm -hmm. Like, that is the connecting factor between Luke, Percy, and Talia. But, like, I I think it's very funny that in a world like this, where nobody talks about how unhappy they are, which is, like, every abusive family in existence, Mm -hmm. that the fact that Talia and Percy say out loud, I don't like my dad sometimes, means that people think that they would murder everyone. Like, to Annabeth, the idea that one of them might join Luke and kill everyone they know is possible because them just saying out loud, my dad sucks sometimes, is that dangerous of a thing to say. It's like, that's amazing, because that that is how it is in families like that. Like, you say, like, one thing, and people... And everyone looks at you like you're like a demon (laughs) from the underworld. And it's usually like very small things Mm -hmm. of like, I don't like it when he raises his voice and they just look at you like you just like grew 16 heads and are like talking in like tongues or something. Um, So that's very accurate, but I just think it's so funny how repressed, like, talking about your emotions are in, in situations like that, where 
Annabeth legitimately asks him that. <laughs> like, I know you're mad at, at Poseidon sometimes. Would you be willing to kill us all because it made your dad unhappy? No. <laughs> like, no. It just, it reminds me so much of, you know, the videos on here sometimes that I, I ignore with every fiber of my being of like a parent yelling about their no contact children. Mm -hmm. of just being like you're a monster you're you want to kill me and it's like no i just want you to shut the fuck up that's that's literally all it is i just want my dad to not abandon me constantly and acknowledge that i exist mm -hmm. that's pretty much it <laughs> and with like with zeus actually that goes with zeus too zeus can shut the fuck up <laughs> um in one of the interviews with walker he mentioned that i thought was a, a smart way to put it that i hadn't considered before that thalia and percy are similar but they also show how different their parents are and the fact that they're similar but different is a good way of showing why poseidon and zeus can also never get along because yeah thalia and him do not get along at all at first it she's She's the type of person that puts people through a lot of stuff to like prove that mm -hmm. she can trust them. And she's also just someone that is kind of taking out things that she doesn't like on Percy because he's, it's easy to take it out on him. Like she's upset that Luke is evil. Mm -hmm. She's a, She doesn't like it that Annabeth is closer to Percy than she is with her anymore. And so when Annabeth is gone, she basically has like free reign to like treat him like garbage and Annabeth isn't there to like, you know, stop her or even just make her feel bad about doing it. Like, there's a part in Capture the Flag in the third book where she electrocutes him twice. Mm -hmm. For no reason. Like, there's no actual reason for it. She, the first time she does it and she says it's an accident and he gets mad and throws water on him, on her and is like, oh, that was an accident too. It's in no way like dangerous to her for her to just be wet. And in response to that, she electrocutes him again. And so that's their dynamic for a good part of Titan's curse. She's very hard on him and put and just for nothing. <laughs> he hasn't actually done anything to justify her being that hard on him in that way. But their dynamic is very much like that, where they get along sometimes, but then other times Thalia likes having if she has a fatal flaw, I think her fatal flaw is needing to be in control, mm -hmm. um, which is also something Walker said in that same interview. And I was like, yes, correct child. Good job. Um, because he, because yeah, like even her sacrificing herself, um, the way that she does is her taking control. Like instead of running into camp and taking the chance that something might work out, instead I'm going to sacrifice myself so that I can take control of my fate and not have to wonder if I'm going to be okay anymore. And instead, I'll just kill myself instead of taking the chance that everything will work out. And so even though they both do the same thing, like sacrificing themselves is for completely different reasons. Like she does it to feel like she's in control of things. He does it because he doesn't think that he matters as much as other people. Yeah, it's that it's that sort of dynamic and i'm really interested to see if they do any flashback scenes with her at all in this season i hope that they do just yeah. purely because i know everybody wants literally everyone who loves percy jackson wants to see her and would want because the the thing i forgot to say earlier about when annabeth is telling like their a little bit of their backstory that she doesn't get to finish is um she says that she thinks that the Cyclops they ran into mm -hmm. is the reason why they don't make it back to camp. That's not, Luke is the reason why they don't make it back to camp. And so one of the things I think is always really interesting about Percy stuff in general, and from like the different perspectives they show things from, is that like in her mind, remembering things when she was seven years old, she sees Luke as like this hero person that's, doing all these things and showing that he cares in a way that her dad never did and so mm -hmm. she thinks that he's amazing and so to little her like it wouldn't enter her mind that he is actually the problem <laughs> that him like trying to battle everything they run into and starting all of these fights is actually the reason 
why they don't make it back to camp on time. And so that's part of why I really want them to sh actually show a flashback of that at some point in mm -hmm. this season or next season or something, or even seasons after that, because it would show how, like to Annabeth, this is what's going on. But us as the audience would probably have a totally different interpretation of watching things because we would pick up on stuff that little her would not be able to see. And it, whenever she tells Percy that whole story, he, I don't think he agrees with her. Yeah. Um, but it's just one of those things of real life, like she does not understand that quite yet. Um, well, it's also interesting. So knowing that the problem with Luke is that he, he wanted to fight everything. Mm -hmm. And they're literally at one of their little camps, you know, like kind of calling back to that trio. And here at this camp is where they do their tactical retreat from the Hydra. They don't try to fight it. I mean, Percy mistakenly takes off a head before he remembers, oh shit, I'm not supposed to do that because it's instinct. Mm -hmm. um, but other than that, they're not really engaging in this fight. They are trying to retreat and they eventually end retreating. So, you know, it's it's almost like it should click for her that tactical retreat is an option in battle. You are the goddess of warfare's daughter. You should know this. You should know what a tactical retreat is. Um, but you were seven. So this guy who, I mean, it's almost more Aries energy of going in there and I want to defeat all of the monsters. Yeah. He's not a smart dude. There's a reason why Athena got mad at Ares on the battlefield in Troy. Yeah, and I think that's why the talking about this stuff in this season is going to be interesting for the audience to watch. One of those things, like I said, they did well about season one, where they showed us that this world is um, vicious towards the people in it, and that you should be you should be upset that these kids are dealing with this stuff. In this way, with this stuff with Luke, it's like, well, they run away from the Hydra because they realize this is a better idea. They try to find a way to get around the the sea monsters without having to actually fight them, but they don't have a way to get around them, so they have to fight them. Even with Cersei, they basically, like, I can't remember everything that happens, but they still basically try to run out of there as fast as possible. It's not like they stop Cersei or anything like that. They just leave what she's doing there and just go. Mm -hmm. And so a bunch of times, even with them like jumping off of Luke's ship and running away, like a million times in a row in this in this book, they make the choice to like leave a place where instead of staying and fighting. Mm -hmm. And so that's very much like Percy and Annabeth do that a lot as the books go along is they pick and choose what battles to fight. And it's one of those funny things that even somebody who is really smart, like intelligent, like book wise even, or just intelligent in general, like Annabeth, doesn't like still has those like blind spots where she doesn't notice, where she doesn't notice that she doesn't even agree with what past her beliefs, <laughs> but it hasn't like clicked yet that like, current times Annabeth wouldn't make the choices that back when 14 year old 15 year old Luke is doing um but she looks at up at at him like he's a hero because of those decisions even though she would be yelling at him like current her right now would be yelling at him for trying to do that yeah <laughs> it's just one of those things that that's why I hope they do that is to show that stuff because it just makes the point so blatant for the audience of us being like wait a second yeah. what is what is going on here <laughs> well i i hope that they show so much more of this season from annabeth's perspective in general because i i've seen it done well with some ya novels where they'll switch protagonists as the series goes on so like if it's a group then book one is the main protagonist but then book two might be from one of the other group members perspectives um and I, I feel like this book could have benefited from it in a way to get some of that backstory from Annabeth a little bit more. And I can see them fixing that with the show. I could see Rick being like, you know what, let's get in Annabeth's head. Let's show some of these scenes. Let's show her as a little kid running away with Luke and Talia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's what everyone wants for this season is to see like what she thinks was happening during all of those times.
Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, let's see. We talked a bit about the piece with Grover. I mean, that's going to be our first glimpse at um, at Polyphemus's island. So I don't know that they'll do it that way because it doesn't hit the same for a show, I think, to show like in a dream sequence, this is where you guys are going to end up ultimately. Mm -hmm. But I do love that even though Grover and Percy aren't able to talk to each other in this dream sequence, that as scary as it is for him to witness this talk where he's like, I have all these protections on this island, at least he's prepared. At least now he can mentally prepare for, okay, well, once I get on the island, there's going to be other shit. I can deal with that later, but at least I know. Yeah, like at least I know when we get there that we should watch out when we first approach because something something is going to be on us as soon as possible. Yeah. That's always helpful. Yeah, so as as annoying as it is and as terrifying as it is, at least at least it was somewhat helpful. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, but um I I don't how much time has passed? That's like the question that I have because the last dream sequence we had with Grover, he was given 3 days to finish his weaving. And in this oh, one, yes. after he's caught, it's you have one day left, and I'm going to give you this special fleece to spin into yarn. But honestly, that feels like it would slow down the process because then you have to like card and spin and all of that, like process it to make it yarn before you weave it. They are almost there. Like, I do remember that, like, right after they get off of Cersei's Island is when they end up getting there. Um, I don't remember exactly how that happens besides the fact that Percy is his own little compass and just knows exactly where everything is, mm -hmm. which is one thing that they did um, show us in this, in this, in these chapters as well, is the fact that he somehow just knows where they are yes. <laughs> at all times and is like, I don't know what I just did. <laughs> um, but okay, that's weird. But so I think some of that stuff comes into play where they're able to find like the coordinates and all that kind of stuff um because i do remember the them on that island is a whole like longer sort of sequence of the different fights that they get into and things like that before they can actually get back to camp mm -hmm. so they do get there they get there pretty much like right when they need to in order to save him um but it's it's pretty much like they get there right on like the last day when everything is happening yeah i do love that detail that he knows exactly where he is on water and that it's just coming up that is going to be one of the golden lines from walker i'm sure of this season yeah like i don't know like when annabeth's like how did you know that and he's like or he says something like i don't know what's happening <laughs> like i was like picturing walker's face when he was doing that um of just being like what did I just do? Why do I know that? Where did that even come from? What's going on? And Annabeth being like, that must be because of your dad. And he's just sitting there like, that was weird. <laughs> like he can't go in in the air. So I guess that's like the the thing he has to settle with is that he knows everywhere he is when he's on water. Yeah, I also love that he can notice the difference between fresh and salt water without like, yeah. Yeah, a taste or I guess smell could be a giveaway for some people, but not at the switch point. Yeah, that when they go into like the swamp area that he feels like less energy. Mm -hmm. Basically, I liked that and I, I could like very clearly picture where they were, because even though I live very much not in the south, um, mm -hmm. there are areas like that where I live because there's tons of lakes where where I live. And so I've been in places like that even if they weren't in the south so i could like very clearly picture like yeah i could see why even though there's a bunch of water that he wouldn't have the same energy from that water because it's all murky and dark and seaweed and gro and like m what we just call muck on the bottom that like sticks to your feet like the kind of place you you have to wear water shoes in order to swim in it 